to you live from Zion United Methodist Church. It's Sunday Morning Live, live streaming to you on Facebook and wherever you're listening. This is Howard Greenfield, a face from the past. I was pastor here at Zion United Methodist Church from 98 to 2011. We had 13 wonderful years here pastoring the people of this church. And it's wonderful that Pastor Rob invited me back, that he could have a break. By the way, if you're out there listening, Pastor Rob, I'm going to say some corny things, so hang on to your sofa. You never know what I might say about you as well. I just found a plastic ant in your pulpit, by the way. I'd like to know the story behind that. Anyways, it's wonderful to be here. Although this is my first experience, all of you, of preaching to an empty church, I've been in, watching live stream myself over at Grace United Methodist Church in Indiana, and I wondered how Pastor Bill Blair is doing that. Well, now I know how he's doing that. It's really bizarre. So I'm going to try to keep things interesting for all of you, and, and welcome to all our guests. I don't know how far this is reaching. One thing churches are saying is that uh, with this uh, pandemic, uh, outreaches uh, via the internet are taking in more and more viewers. That's wonderful for the gospel. So just pray that as all churches are coming back soon, that here in Pennsylvania, that there'll be more people who feel invited to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do I hear an amen out there? And by the way, today is Pentecost Sunday. You might, many of you have never heard that word. It's a very old word. It literally means the 50th day. 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after Easter, for us who believe in Christ. It's a day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. For without the Holy Spirit, the church would not have been born. And a lot of churches today, it really puzzles me, are forgetting the presence and the need of the Holy Spirit. So that's my topic today, along with us specifically focusing on the need for a spiritual power. You're sitting at home listening today and perhaps you've been feeling powerless in so many ways. Pastors have been feeling powerless, uh, not being able to bring their sheep in to shepherd them at the building sites. And, and so ministry is all online or wearing one of these masks. Yeah, it makes it hard. Uh, if you note know behind me, we have the red flowers on the altar, those are an honor not only of Pentecost, but all our graduates here at Zion United Methodist Church. So I'm really glad to be with you this morning. Before we begin our order of worship, I have some announcements that Pastor Rob has given me. Make sure I cover everything that's so important. First of all, the trustees. All you trustees out there taking care of this beautiful structure. You will be meeting June 3rd, Wednesday night. If you're still meeting at 7 o'clock, be there or be square, okay? You are setting up guidelines, I see, for the usage of the church pavilion. Still 25 or less, but here's the good news. I believe it is, this coming Friday, that the Governor Wolf has given the green light to the last counties here, at least affecting both where I live, Indiana, and here in Butler. So you'll have the green light on this Friday, which might mean a change for some of these guidelines. Okay, so that's good to know. Also, this announcement, the Cabot Food Bank. Wow, has that been a needed mission work in this community for years. Uh, they will be distributing on June 17th with meals being prepared on the 16th. So that's good to see that. And also, and as I'm wearing red, those of you at home, it's very appropriate. One of the best places that I learned to wear red on Pentecost was here at Zion United Methodist Church. So if you don't have any red on right now, go grab some red and throw it on. Guys throw a red tie on, the girls a red scarf, whatever you got. And that's part of celebrating the fire, you see, the fire of the Holy Spirit uh, descending upon the disciples and filling them with the power to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are my announcements, and I would like to begin with a word of Scripture and then an opening prayer. Oh, have you got your Bible with you? I'm going to ask you to look up and follow along with me for these readings. I always have done this in the churches I've served. 
The Bibles are dusty, not only dusty in our homes, but dusty in our sanctuaries because everything's on screens. Dust off that Bible. Put it to use today with me today. For our call to worship, I would like to go right to the book of Acts, the beginning of Acts. The beginning of Acts. Acts 1, verse 4. And what's happening is the resurrected Christ is with his disciples, and he's explaining to them that he will be needing to leave them, to ascend into heaven. But before he left, he gave them these guidelines. He said to them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said, well, they said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but here it is, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Let us join in prayer and bow your heads if you would please with me. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, remind us in this time of worship in our homes that we are not alone. You are with us wherever we live. You find us through your love for us. And many of us are feeling powerless, being stuck in our homes so much, not being able to go to work as we did, many losing their jobs, and churches not being able to come together. We are feeling powerless to be who we truly are, and that includes being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us in this time of worship we share that we would feel your power filling us again, your power of pure love, of hope, of encouragement, and of joy. May it be so that we would be a blessing to you in worshiping you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. I'd like to also turn that we have an opportunity to affirm our faith together. And oh, pa Pastor Rob, you supplied a, a wonderful uh, affirmation of faith, but I thought in our homes... I was remembering as even as a child growing up in Conneville, PA at the Valley Church, one of the first things I learned by heart was the Apostles' Creed. And so if some of you still have this memorized, I'd like to share it with you, that we together this morning could affirm our faith as believers in Jesus Christ through the Apostles' Creed. Share these words with me now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to offer a special thank you to Donna Scholl, and she's listening right now in her office. Hi, Donna! <laughs> Donna was a great friend. In the years I was here, she gave me such great advice and encouragement. I'll never forget those words. But Miss Donna, Miss Donna has prepared the blue box today. 
And the children of the church, if you're listening out there, boys and girls, you put something in this blue box again that I have no idea what's in here. And so I'm going to reach in there and there better not be anything that's going to bite me. Oh, and no toilet paper rolls either like before I left. But we'll see that there's something, and these are items from the church that uh, Miss Donna had you all put in here. So I'm going to move this stand a little bit. I'm going to sit down. And here's the blue box. Ta-da! And I'm going to reach in and see what's in here. Oh, that's the first thing I touched right here. It is, oh, a clock. Oh, no. You know, preachers don't like clocks very well, especially when they're in sanctuaries. Because in every church I've served, when I go over time in preaching, there's always somebody in the back of the sanctuary going like this. And I know it's time I should quit. And do I quit, boys and girls? No. I keep on preaching. Because the clock, well, the clock represents a time the Greeks called chronos which was segmented into days and hours and minutes and blah. But in the Bible, God speaks of Kairos, holy time. And that's the time we're in right now. Boys and girls, if you're watching, this is holy time. When the minutes and seconds don't matter as much as connecting with Jesus, all of us together with him and to God directly through Jesus. It is not that wonderful? Time has changed. And someday all of us will live with Jesus for eternity. And the seconds and the days won't matter because eternity is forever. We'll be with God. So thank you for these. Now there's a lot of items in here. I better not... Do. Now my dear wife Trudy is with me. She's here. Shall I look at all of these? Oh shoot. All right. Let's see what else we got in here. This is a mailing envelope. You know what? God didn't know how to come to us, so he sent one of us. And that's the mailing envelope God sent to us with the word inside Jesus. And that's what the New Testament is. Oh, okay. Here's a pair of scissors. Ah, they're sharp. The word of God is sharp. It's like a two-edged sword cutting through falsehood. All right, let's see what else we have here. Uh-oh, a microphone. Testing, one, two, three. Oh, boys and girls, if you're going to be watching this, later on I'll have a little story about a microphone and a bishop. But you know, a microphone amplifies the voice. And each of us is an amplifier of God's voice every single day. What else we got in here? Oh, we got napkins. If you make a mess at meals, you got to have a napkin to wipe your mouth. So... You might say the mistakes. God's love just wipes all our sins away, including when we make a mess. All right. I don't know if I can do all this. Oh, the, oh, this is mixed nuts. And I'm one of them. And so are you. We're all a bag of mixed nuts. But God loves us anyway. Oh, and that's for me later, by the way. <laughs> What's this? A t oh, an attendance pad. If you're listening today and you're not a member of a church, this is something very important for churches to take care of people who are visiting. So come to church, fill out one of these, any church, and the pastor or someone will be in touch with you to help you in whatever way. That's so, oh, there might be one other item here. Oh, streamers or, oh, I know what this is. Cheerleading. Oh, no, 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 no. We need to be cheerleaders for Christ. Amen? Boy, that was... And that's it. I think, oh, no. Oh, shoot. There's still... What's it? Uh, a little pair of scissors. I already did the scissors. Uh, and glue. In the church, we're all different. We all can't agree. And guess what? That's okay. Because Jesus glues us together. His love keeps us together. And we can love each other because of our differences, because we don't agree all the time. If we agree that God loves us and Jesus is our Savior, we have the glue that keeps us.
keeps us together. Amen. I think that's it. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me offer a prayer for all the boys and girls. Dear God, in Jesus' name, bless the children today. And bless those who are helping them find Jesus like Miss Donna. Help us all to know that everything in life can remind us of you, Lord. Because you've created it for us to enjoy and to be happy and to be filled with your love. So thank you for all these little items in the blue box today. May they give us joy for the rest of the week until we can be together. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said, amen, amen. All right. Let's see where we are. Oh, time for a prayer. I have some prayer concerns. I'd like to share those with you, all of you today. And I'd like a time of silence and I'll say a, a prayer for those of us who are together. First of all, I think we need to really pray for all the churches that are coming back to me. Not only the governmental guidelines, but there's, there's difference of opinion on how we do this in churches. And right now, I think we need to pray for all the churches, especially this coming Sunday as we may be coming back to worship together. It's difficult. People will still be fearful. Some will want to wear masks, others feel comfortable not to. Six feet apart, yeah, that's one of the guidelines. Um, you know, sanitizing uh, abilities that churches provide, that's important too. But we need to be praying for all the churches and to let those who are seeking yet uh, Jesus in their lives to know that God really does love them and accept them and cherishes them. They'll be watching the churches on how they do this and that all will be invited to come back. So let's keep our churches in prayer. We need to keep the violence and the situations in our American cities in prayer that all started out at Minneapolis uh, with George Floyd's death. Uh, I understand now, as of last evening, the violence has come to Pittsburgh and it's already hitting other major cities. The police have been called to assist and to help protect property and other people. We need to pray for peace, amen. We really do. And for justice. We need to pray for both. Peace and justice. We need to pray for our United Methodist Church. Uh, with this pandemic, this movement toward a critical decision in the history of the whole denomination has been postponed, but it may still yet be before us this, this summer. So I just ask that you pray for the United Methodist denomination. And also, I've noted a spirit of division and divisiveness in our nation, perhaps throughout the world. And this pandemic seems to have accentuated that. People not agreeing on the proper process of caring for the individuals who are sick. I think we need to pray not only for those families who have lost loved ones in this pandemic, but also the anger, resentment, the hostility that seems to be brewing between Christians, between political parties, within communities, it seems to be everywhere. I think we need to be peacemakers. But peacemakers who are reaching out with both justice and love, and not being controlled by a spirit of fear, but a spirit of faith. Amen. So let's share a time of silence. I ask you to just close your eyes. I know at home there's a lot of distractions. I've been there find myself looking out the window at neighbors walking by or, you know, the TV flickering. Close your eyes and let's have a time of silent prayer. Let's be in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Christ's name, we seek your presence this morning presence of strength and love and yes power we have been in our home so long we have been afraid to get too close to people we've had difficulty hearing other people when they speak with our masks on we felt powerless to communicate we have been with family members so much we're we're getting annoyed by each other 
Perhaps in that annoyance, we've had to go deeper in relationships, even with our own families, to better understand each other. Lord, we gather this morning to better understand you and all you do for us. Take away the spirit of fear. Take away the spirit of powerlessness and restore us, revive us, renew us. Give us the faith we, we pray for this morning as even the disciples pray for greater faith, so do we. And help us to know that we cannot muster faith all on our own. Faith itself is a gift you've given us through your Holy Spirit. Help us to learn today how to pray for your Holy Spirit's power. Help us to know that we can do nothing apart from your Holy Spirit that would please you. And may our hearts be open to your Holy Word today. The words of Christ, how he's always been with us. How the words of Christ that give comfort and strength and power when the times are the darkest. That we can stand in the violence, we can stand in the helplessness, and we can stand with hope and joy, and especially the love of Jesus Christ shining from our very souls. May it be so in this time that we will renew our faith in you, for it is in Jesus Christ we pray, who has taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen and amen. Pastor Rob has shared that you have a time in your worship of scripture reading and a reminder of how God has given his son to us. We need to return a gift of ourselves to him. From Psalm 103, verses 3 to 5, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in our home, we are now looking at our checkbooks. We are considering the ways we can give to your church. And not just here at Zion, but your church throughout the world. Where would we be without the gospel of Jesus Christ? Bless these gifts. That they would begin anew the strength and power of your church in this time of such difficulty and violence, Lord. Let people hear the gospel of Jesus through our gifts. Use our hearts, use our lives, and use our gifts to his glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken again from Acts where the church really needed power. The disciples had begun to be persecuted. In fact, two of their leaders, Peter and John, had been put in jail by the Sanhedrin. That was the leading council of, of the Jews. And they were returning to this church, now frightened and timid and scared. And this is what happened from Acts 4, 23, through 31. Okay, now get that Bible. Remember I told you, get that Bible out. I'll give you a moment. Acts 4, 23 through 31. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, 
There are so many words we read and hear during any given day. Many of them are not true. Many of them do not help us or comfort us. Comfort us now, we ask in Christ's name with this word from the book of Acts. May his spirit abide in our hearts as we listen to the power given to your church. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Sound familiar? Hmm. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. I'd like to begin with a story about a Methodist pastor who was very excited to bring in the new bishop. And he had trained his congregation that whenever they had Holy Communion, he would always begin saying, the Lord be with you. And what would the people say? Say it at home. And also with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Right? So the bishop arrived and all the the fuss and the muss and everything and he, he stepped out to the, the microphone and he was beginning to start the communion service the bishop was and he said something and, and nobody heard anything and he, he, he tapped on it and there was something he said oh tapped on the microphone must be something wrong with this and the congregation instantly said and also with you <laughs> Oh, such moments really happen, really. Most people agree that there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong with the church today. As someone has once said, why can't we just get along? Yeah, it's not happening as it once was as I remember. Something's wrong in the church. It's not the same as it was 20 years ago, even 40 years ago, about the time I was starting out. You know, churches are saying, you know, well, can't we just come back the way we want? You know, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible, God helps those who help themselves? Ah, I used to believe it did say that. But I did a little homework. It doesn't. In fact, that quote, God helps those who help themselves, comes from Ben Franklin in 1757. And he was actually quoting an Algernon Sidney who wrote those words in 1698. But no, what the Bible says is something radically different. God helps the helpless. God helps those who admit and confess their helpless without him. Isaiah 25, 4, Lord, you have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress. In Romans 5, 6, you see at just the right time when we were still considered powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. The poor, the needed, needy, the powerless, these are the ones God wants to help today. If you find yourself in that group, join the club. 
So why are so many good church-going people today only calling on, calling on God's help at the last minute, as a last resort? Why do we still try to do it on our own? You know, good United Methodist, what do we do if there's a problem? Oh, we've got to write a new rule. Got to be a new guideline. Got to do this. Ha have more meetings. Why are churches that are calling upon God's help and confessing they're helpless to do anything to please him without his Holy Spirit. A Gallup poll says that the church has changed drastically in these last years. One thing is that when I started out, you know, there's, there's a lot of respect for churches and pastors. But we used to be number one in the 80s as far as confidence level. That's what the Gallup poll says. America had a confidence in the churches. Today, we've dropped at least fourth place and maybe lower. The public confidence is leaving. We're behind the military, small businesses, and the police. In fact, we're up to a quarter of the citizens in the United States of America no longer attend any worship service. That's inclusive Christian Jewish, Muslim, a quarter. How do we do it then? How can we bring back this church that we long for, that perhaps we've known in the past? There's only one way I, I can know that I have found through my years of caring for God's people. And that is only with God's help. As a pastor, I had to learn the hard lesson that no, ma no matter how new the program was for church growth or or following the guidelines of our denominational discipline, or trying to be as charismatic as I possibly could, nothing was working to help the churches I served until I turned to God and God alone. Jesus said, yes, in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the you see, with the Holy Spirit, you can have a powerful church. Without the Holy Spirit, you have a powerless church. With the Holy Spirit, God is helping the church. Without the Holy Spirit, the church is helpless. And what does that mean, a church that is helpless? Remember what Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. And there it is. There's the connection. The Holy Spirit was given to the church by Jesus to be his witness in the world. Without the Holy Spirit, the church cannot fulfill its purpose. What is the purpose of the church? To witness about Jesus Christ as a savior of the world. We have no other real purpose. To witness to Jesus Christ. This then is a helpless church. A church that is not witnessing about Jesus. My friends, there's a lot of churches out there, big buildings, big additions, fancy academic sermons, a lot of programming, but the members and maybe even the pastor have forgotten to witness about Christ and Christ alone. It's all about us and what we can do. Oh, there's so many churches, you know, that a lot of people will talk about what a good Methodist they are, a good Presbyterian, or a good Lutheran, or a good Catholic. They'll talk about, oh, I'm a good, upright citizen to witness about that. I'm involved in the community. I serve on this board and that board. Today, they're even witnessing about, I'm a good Republican, and I'm a good Democrat. I'm a good Independent. But these are still helpless churches if the members are not talking and witnessing and giving a direction of point, Jesus Christ is the only answer in my life. Church members have not asked the Holy Spirit to help them witness about Christ and Christ alone. The great Methodist preacher, Reverend Samuel Chadwick, has said this, he takes it a step further. He says, quote, the Christian religion is hopeless, hopeless without the Holy Ghost. That's similar to what Jesus himself said. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. 
Simply put, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to help us stay with Jesus, to grow in Jesus, and to share Jesus with others. That is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is received by the church, incredible things happen, as in today's reading. Peter and John thrown in prison, they come back. Now the church could have said, oh, what was us? You know, we got the powers that be that are after us. Just like the government, all these guidelines on how the church can meet or not meet. Oh, I ask you, is it a spirit of fear in the church as well? Or is it a spirit of faith? The people who met Peter and John said, Lord, consider their threats, that Sanhedrin, and enable your servants to speak your word in great boldness. And there it is, great boldness. They could have run away with their tails down, but they prayed for greater boldness. And what happened? Quote, after they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not just for show. It's not just for various manifestations. It's not just even the fruit of the Spirit. The purpose of the filling of the Spirit is that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, the change of character and the fruit of the Spirit, all the gifts of the Spirit are all for that one purpose, to witness to the world that we're still the church, no matter what. And we're here to tell people about Christ. They were given divine, powerful confidence to share their faith. Simply, when they asked, they were given. As Jesus said, if you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who simply ask Him? Ask, and you shall receive. Have we asked for the Holy Spirit? Well, you might be saying at home, Hey, that old guy on the tube this morning, he's, you know, he's talking about us sharing our faith. Oh, I tried that once, boy, and I say the wrong thing, you know? I made somebody wonder what the heck I was doing. Well, Jesus says, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. You have to realize that our humanness, our frailties, our faults, our stupidity, God can use all of that. And the witness that you have in your life is not weakened by who you are. It's strengthened. And the struggles and the heartaches you've had will be a blessing when others hear and know you understand what they're going through and still your faith shines. There's a great movie out there. I just saw it. I still believe. If you can see it, watch it. Our, how powerful is the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian? Sometimes we forget in our own individual lives. It's not just the church. It's in our own life. Before you were saved, you were convicted of your own sinfulness. What, by your own realizations? No, by the Holy Spirit that you had to realize that nothing in your own goodness could save you. John 16, 8, when the Spirit comes, he will prove that the world to be is in wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. You have to realize through the Spirit that everything the world has to offer will never satisfy your soul. That's the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit was there as well. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. And now you may be walking as a Christian for years. How have you grown with the assurance that you are saved in Christ? Again, only through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You can't make that certainty up on your own. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. And today, if you know God has blessed you with the gifts of the Spirit, they're all for the purpose of building the church. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit at work again. 
There are many gifts of the Holy Spirit, but they all are given to help the church be powerful. Not in worldly terms, not political power, not military power, not economic power, spiritual power. We cannot create that power. Only the Holy Spirit is able to do so. Paul writes that even our physical bodies take on their true purpose. Your body, you might be trying to lose weight for summer, look good in that swimsuit, I don't know. But your body, what's the purpose of your body? To look good, to be strong and fit? No. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Yes, we are to care for our bodies, but not to be vain and look better, but a better temple for the Holy Spirit. Jim Cimbala, one of my favorite authors, has written a book called Spirit Rising. I recommend it to you. Right now, if you still have time here at home, get a book. Spirit Rising by Jim Cimbala. In this book, he says this, if the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside a person, no church membership or even a sincere effort to live a good life can make that person a Christian. Only true faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, confirmed by the Holy Spirit living inside us, makes us that new creation. You want to be new in any way? Ask for the Holy Spirit. And your body also, the physical part of who you are, will be given new meaning. The early church was alive and active because of the Holy Spirit. The early church didn't have buildings. The early church didn't even have Bibles. The early church didn't have disciplines or church governments and institutions. What the Holy Spirit had, the believers had one another. And they had the Holy Spirit. And that was enough. That's what we need today. In this time of uncertainty and darkness, the pandemic and the pandemonium in our cities, you need the Holy Spirit. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You can't do it on your own. No matter how many years you've been a Christian, no matter how many positions you have in the church, you can't do it. You need the Holy Spirit. You want to be a powerful church? You want to shake that sense of powerlessness? Join me in asking for the Holy Spirit. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, in Christ's name, sometimes we forget, dear Lord, the third person of your Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Perhaps we believe, oh, that's just for those churches, those more charismatic churches. They get all caught up in all weird things. Lord, forgive us for this attitude. Forgive us. Jesus himself told us to wait. And so teach us how to wait again for your Holy Spirit. Teach us that if we are living with a spirit of fear to recognize it and cast it off in Jesus' name. Just cast it off. Teach us to know that you do not want us to live helpless lives. Give give us your Holy Spirit. But may we have that yearning, that sincere asking in our hearts, because that is assured throughout Scripture that you listen and answer to every sincere prayer. That prayer of confession, that prayer of confessing helplessness and brokenness and inability to be able to be in the right position to receive. I pray for the members of Zion United Methodist Church. I pray for the the pastor and the leaders of this church family that each of them all would ask to receive the Holy Spirit today. Today. And that there would be a unity. That there would be a peace. There would be an assurance of goodness and joy forthcoming. A new beginning. A revival. A renewal of your church, dear Lord. May it be so. This is our prayer. To be the powerful church you've created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now receive the benediction. May may God be with you.
in your home, in your family. May God be with you through the Holy Spirit in your heart. Bless you and keep you.